All right, friends. Well, we um, missed a week together so that we could uh, talk a little bit about congregational evangelism, and uh, but uh, I think that was a wonderful time. We're going to jump back in this week with our fifth lesson in um, um, our Christian of our, our Pillars of Christian Character uh, series, and as you can see, our topic we're going to be thinking about is um, unity. Unity. Would you say that unity is important in the church? Does the Bible seem to indicate unity is important? Has anybody ever been in a situation uh, where you've experienced disunity in the church? I know that some have before uh, been through even kind of the worst moments of uh, unity or disunity, and that is um, a church split. Anybody ever been through a church split before? Uh, They're rare, thankfully, but they do sometimes happen, and they are the outgrowth of when unity has been broken and things really, really break down. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to open up to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 4, and uh, would somebody be willing to uh, read that text for us? Let me see here. Ray, can I call on you? Don, you've already got it? Okay. Uh, Give everybody a moment to get there, including the teacher. We know that there were churches in the New Testament that had issues with um, unity, (laughs) disunity. So let's hear at least uh, for, uh, for our purposes one such church. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollo, are you not being merely human? Okay, thank you for that reading. Um, Disunity was an issue in Corinth. Uh, in the church that the Apostle Paul was ministering to. In fact, most of the first three chapters of that letter deal with disunity. And, uh, you know, Paul knew the kind of dangers that lurked uh, when infighting began to happen within the churches. And it's very logical that um, he would exhort the churches that he ministered to really everywhere to maintain unity. And so we're going to think about that today. Now, why is it important for us to talk about unity? Well, the maintenance of spiritual unity really is a continual concern of every one of us who are Christians, who belong to the church, right? And we need to notice as we talk about unity today, this is a unity that is not just artificially manufactured, okay? You'll hear me use the phrase spiritual unity because this is a unity which comes of God. It's a spiritual uh, unity. If you only by human efforts try to maintain unity, of course, there's a need for us to be responsible to that, but we need something greater than just man-made unity. We need the unity that comes from the inner self, the spiritual self, that binds all believers together in the work of their lives. This is a unity, ultimately, which is born out of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to be thinking about the ways in which spiritual unity differs from the unity of the world. Now, the unbelieving world around us doesn't really know anything of the unity that God's Spirit can give. As long as unbelieving people and believing people give way to sin, give way to self-centeredness, to their rights, kind of prestige, um, true harmony, the kind that comes from the Holy Spirit is never going to be achieved. And so what I want to invite you to do now is turn from 1 Corinthians 3 over to Ephesians 4. That's going to be our main text uh, today. And we're going to look at Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, kind of our main uh, text. 
And we're turning there because Paul gives a really nice definition of spiritual unity. And he lists features that come from the Holy Spirit um, and kind of in list form uh, gives us those things that are most relevant to us in terms of unity. And as we're going to see without understanding and embracing these kind of inner spiritual aspects of unity, and we're going to hear about that in a second from the text, believers can never really experience unity practically. And so let's look at Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 together and kind of get a sense of where we're talking about unity in a Godward way. Paul writes there, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, as we jump into these features, I want to kind of give us just a little practical outline and note that the first feature in terms of unity that we encounter in Paul is the unity of the Holy Spirit. The true church is made up of every believer who uh, has trusted or who will trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. If you were to ask me this morning, Matthew, what is the church? I would tell you the church is that one body of saints that has no sectarian, no political, uh, no ethnic, not even any geographical divisions. In fact, we are a local outpost, the Plymouth Church of Christ, of that universal church that exists within the world. And we see an indication of that in the Bible because often the church is called something of Christ. What's the phrase that's used sometimes to describe the church? The something of Christ. The bride. Yeah, that wasn't the one I was thinking about. That's a really good one, though. In fact, let's just put that one up top here. I like that. It's another B word, but that one's very good. Body. Yeah, the body. And like the bride, um, when Rachel and I got married, she didn't come in parts, did she? She was all together Rachel one bride, and the body of Christ is one entity, right? It deserves this name better than any other label that we could put on it in our own wisdom. And you know, every believer, of course, is indwelt by the one and only Holy Spirit. That's why I want to start talking first about unity in terms of the presence of the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God who really ultimately holds the church together. Um, Ray, can I ask you to turn over to 1 Corinthians 3 and read for us verses 16 and 17? First Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Very good. Each individual Christian, us, we are a part of the what? Paul just told us, right? The temple of God. In fact, your body, your life is an individual temple, and you are being fitted together. Paul says you are growing into a temple of the Lord. Right? You see this unity that comes from the Spirit. In fact, in Ephesians 2, Paul will remind us we are built together into a dwelling of God, and he says, in the Spirit. So those things knit you together to these other believers. I sometimes marvel when I think about, I don't know any other way in which we as a group of people might have been brought together in life. Was it not for the work of Christ and that knitting together that happens in the Holy Spirit? You know, when we leave this congregational meeting today and we go out into our lives, we're going to very different places, different homes, different vocations, different stages of life. There are a variety of differences about us. 
But there is one thing that unifies us. It is our head, Jesus Christ, and that we are redeemed to God, reconciled to him through the work of Christ, and we're knit together in the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, uh, Paul will say in Ephesians 1, is a kind of divine pledge. It's a promise to each of us that one day when Christ returns, every one of us in Christ are going to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's the pledge that that will happen? It's that the Holy Spirit is a part of your life and my life. And so Paul will say here in Ephesians 4, look at verse 4 for just a second. If you are a believer, you are united with other believers, notice, in one hope of your calling. In one hope of your calling. What is Paul saying there? He says the Holy Spirit calls you to salvation, but not only that, he calls each one of us to spiritual Christ-like maturity. And this, of course, includes a commitment to unity. So there are different spiritual gifts. There are a variety of ministries. Uh, Here I see Don, our deacon over missions, right? I see uh, Sarah, who's leading up the charge for the baskets and the feeding of the poor. I see a variety of different ministries present here. There are many places where we can serve God. How many callings are there? There's only one, right? And so Don, as he does his work, he's fulfilling that one calling. As I do my work teaching today from God's word, I'm fulfilling my calling, right? When each one of you individually do the work that God has called you to, being the presence of Christ in the world, you're fulfilling the one calling too. My calling is the same calling that you have. It's a calling to be for Christ in the world. And so there's unity of the Holy Spirit spirit the holy spirit all right let's talk about the uh second uh feature of unity and um laura could i invite you to read verse five again for us uh oh sorry yes ephesians uh uh, four verse five One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Who is the one Lord? (laughs) Laura Laura laughs at my question. It's obvious, right? Of course she laughs because we know who it is, right? There is salvation found in no other name than whose name? Right, Jesus. This is what Peter preached in Acts chapter 4. Uh, He told the Ephesians the same thing in here in verse 5 that you gave us just a moment uh, ago. Paul will say in Romans chapter 10 that the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. Now, let me make a connection. Let me make a connection. Between what Laura just read and you just told me, that one Lord, of course, is Jesus Christ, and the teaching of God's Word. Because there's only one Lord and Savior, there really is just one true body of doctrine revealed by the one Lord in the New Testament. If somebody, let me ask Pat, could I ask you to turn over to the little letter of Jude right before the book of Revelation? Do you mind reading verse 3? There's no chapter numbers in Jude. It's so short. So it's one of those funny books like Philemon that you just say, Jude, verse (laughs) 3. Or you say, Philemon, verse 18. (laughs) You don't have to do any chapter because there's only, there's no chapters, right? It is very short, yeah, and you can miss it very easily. So if you don't mind uh, reading Jude 3. Yeah. Verse 3, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation you share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. 
Very good. Thank you for that, Pat. Uh, there is one Lord. There is one true doctrine of the New Testament. And how did Jude just describe that body of doctrine right there? It is the faith. Remember what she, she just read? The faith once for all delivered to whom? To the saints. Yep, very good. In fact, you may not know this, Jude in his own community of Christians was contending for unity in his own corner of the world. It's a very common problem. And he was seeing disruptions in the churches that he ministered amongst. And one of the ways that he dealt with that disunity is he said, look, here's what we need to do. We need to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. There's a reminder in this. Where am I going with this? Here's where I'm going. If with the Lord's help, we faithfully, we carefully study God's word, we will find that yes, scripture does contain many individual truths, many different things, but they are always, and this is a good way to think about your Bible study, Scripture has many individual truths, but they are always part of the harmonious facet of Christ's one truth. I don't know who all here, I don't have a diamond ring on, <laughs> but uh, Rachel has a diamond ring on. I bought her uh, when we got engaged. And you can look at it, and you can look at the diamond on the ring. In fact, that diamond has been in my uh, uh, mind recently because it popped off the little prong crown uh, one of the things broke and we thought we had lost it somewhere in the house uh, by God's grace we found it in her purse it had not gone that was going to be an expensive accident but uh, we found it had a new crown made and uh, it's good to go Margie was a part of that day she remembers me coming in and going hmm I might have a little problem <laughs> and she recommended the jeweler in Canton that fixed it up when we finally found it well that diamond if we want to think about it is in many ways uh, analogous to the one faith, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. There are many individual truths, many facets that shine within that diamond, but there is one faith, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 5. And so we understand then that we are united by the Holy Spirit, by one Lord, into, and let me just change this so that it reflects the language of Jude, into the one faith, right? Where does this unity flow? Unity of the Holy Spirit and the one Lord into the one faith. How do we best then testify to this unity, this one Lord, this one faith? We testify to that unity by means of a very, very important ordinance. There are only two ordinances in the church. One we know as the Lord's Supper. We're going to take the Lord's Supper this morning. And just a heads up, this is you get this extra information because you're here early for Bible class. Lord's Supper is going to come after the sermon today. Okay. And so a little bit of a different thing. The word will precede the Lord's Supper. But that's one of the ordinances. What is one of our greatest testimonies to the unity of the faith that we all participate in if we are Christians? It is the one baptism, right? This is a, a great public testimony to the fact that there is unity in the Holy Spirit. And of course, there is without question just one true baptism, one true spiritual baptism. We might even put it that way, implied in the fourth verse of Ephesians 4. And all believers are placed into the body of Christ, the body of Christ. There's one water baptism, which is, of course, the most common New Testament way of publicly confessing faith in Jesus Christ and solidarity with him. I remember years ago I heard Ephlegard Smith. Does anybody know that name? He's written like the chrono chronological Bible and several different things. Carl, correct me if I'm, I think there was a book he wrote on baptism and he called it wasn't it the believers wedding ceremony or something I like that he he was using the analogy of a marriage ceremony 
to describe what happens in baptism, right? That there's, the, there's all of this symbolism that's invested in that. And I thought it was clever uh, in, in some way. But baptism, of course, is the New Testament way of, of really publicly confessing, confessing faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let me just speak to that real quick before we move on. One of the reasons I am hesitant, unless there's a really compelling reason, to do private baptisms anymore is it kind of defeats the purpose of what baptism is meant to be. Now, I know there are extenuating circumstances where sometimes people, they're, you know, they may have medical things or you know, general anxiety disorder or something where they're just like, I cannot be up front in front of a group of people. I'm always sensitive to that. But I always, if possible, would want to do a baptism in a very public way because it really is uh, the chance for us to publicly not only uh, renounce the old way of life and uh, in the early church this looked like even uh, renunciation of the ways of the devil. They would kind of use this language, I renounce you devil, and, and then they would go ahead and publicly uh, pronounce their intention to follow Christ. Uh, and and that, that public declaration, of course, we know uh, for those, for example, in the Middle East today could even cost them their lives. Think about those Christians in Afghanistan. And yet um, this is the call and this is uh, the way. And so believers are, are not to be baptized in the name of a, a local church. Uh, Paul, uh, he said, look, it doesn't matter if you're of Paul or of Apollos or any of those other kind of things that the Corinthians were struggling with. You're not baptized uh, into the name of a, an influential elder or a, a famous evangelist or even the greatest apostle. You're only baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, we know from the Great Commission, you're baptized in the name of Father and Son and Holy Spirit. In fact, I would argue where baptism is not done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it's not truly Christian baptism. So you'll always hear me say, I baptize you in the name of and you've heard me probably do that before, right? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Very important. Questions or thoughts about that? Things that that brings up for you all as you think about your own baptisms or the unity of the faith? Carl. I had, uh, a message to uh, Brother Lamozell and said, can we use your swimming pool? <laughs> Yeah. And I'm always sensitive to if there's some compelling kind of thing. But but I I do think that our baptisms are a form of preaching. We're publicly proclaiming the name of Christ and our willingness in repentance and faith to uh, enter under his lordship, his reign. It's a little bit like the knights of old. Remember, I got to be careful with my analogies here. But remember, the knights of old would swear. Here's an old word for you. They would swear fealty or allegiance to whatever Lord they were fighting for. And oftentimes there tended to be in that moment kind of a, a ceremony uh, with swords and different things like that. But they were swearing publicly their allegiance that they would fight for Lord and manor or lands. And they were pledging themselves. Baptism is very much uh, in that same uh, stripe. And so we're proclaiming that the Lordship of Christ is reigning here in my life. I've counted the cross. I'm taking up my cross now and following Lord Jesus. In that way, think about then these two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Are we proclaiming something in both of those things? Very much. What are we proclaiming in the Lord's Supper this morning when we take that or we observe that together? What does Paul say about that in 1 Corinthians 11? Anybody remember? We're proclaiming his death, right? How long are we doing that? Until he comes again. Yeah, till he comes, sometimes it says. 
um, we're proclaiming the one Lord, the one faith in our baptism. So, unity of the Holy Spirit, unity in Christ and his doctrine, the one Lord and the one faith. There is also, look at Ephesians 4, verse 6. There is unity in God the Father. Unity in God the Father. Would somebody read verse 6 for us? Could I call Sarah? Would you mind doing that? Thanks. Very good. There is unity in God the Father. Uh, has anybody heard in uh, Israel, ancient Israel and Judaism, of the Shema? The Shema. It's a famous kind of confession, one of the only confessions that the Jews make. It comes from uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Let's turn over there together. I want to kind of show you what Paul's doing based upon this uh, ancient thing. Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Shema will be familiar to you when you hear it. This is sometimes called the central confession of ancient Israel. The word comes from the Hebrew, hear, and uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 begins with the word hear. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Very important passage in the life of ancient Israel, and we're hearing echoes of it here in Ephesians 4 from the Apostle Paul. What do we know about the Apostle Paul? Had he trained in Jewish religion before he became the great missionary to the Gentiles? Yeah, he trained under a very famous rabbi. Uh, Gamaliel was this rabbi's name. In fact, Paul had a lot of, we'd call them bona fides in the Jewish faith. He knew the Shema, right? And so there's a oneness here that he's drawing on, rooted in the Shema. And so Paul makes this comprehensive statement in Ephesians 4, verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What is he saying here? Paul's referring to the magnificent, the eternal unity that God the Father gives to the saints, Christians, by God the Spirit through the Son. And so Paul's point here in Ephesians 4 is to refer to the unique roles of each member of the Trinity, and yet noting their unity, their sovereign, loving, uh, powerful holding together of the church as one people. So there's a unity in God uh, the Father. Now notice these first three statements we've pulled out. There's unity of the Spirit. There's unity in Christ, one Lord. There is unity in God. This is a, a very powerful Trinitarian passage, right? Uh, of God's threeness and his oneness. And so there is uh, in our unity a reflection of the unity that dwells within God himself. There is only one God eternally existing in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the unity that the Godhead enjoys flows to us by the Spirit, and we are meant to enjoy that same unity together. Now, there are things that can break that unity, sinfulness, of course, when brothers and sisters do not strive together or bear each other's burdens, that unity can break down. But ultimately, like a marriage, and the unity in marriage, which reflects the relationship between Christ and the church, our unity is meant to be a reflection of the unity that exists in the Godhead. So very important. Does that make sense? Very good. Okay, the implication of all this comes in our fourth and final point. Unity in the purity of the truth. The purity of the truth. How do we maintain and lean into the unity that we have. The implication of all that Paul has been saying here in Ephesians 4 is that in addition to the essential truth that the church must maintain its unity, 
is that believers must unite around the truth. The truth. This is capital T truth. I know we live in postmodern times where many will tell us today there's no such thing as objective truth. That is not true for the Christian. We can put it that way. There is objective truth, and it comes from the word of God. And what I mean by this is <clears throat> we must never settle for a unity which comes at the expense of God's truth. You know, we could declare ourselves unified to non-believers, but that's not true unity. We might get along without discord. We may love them and serve them as our neighbors, but there's no true unity with those who are outside of God's truth. And what that means for us is that we must strive for a unity that is based on a common understanding of who God is, what his will is, and there's only really one place we can go for that, and that is to a common understanding of Scripture. doesn't mean that we'll see everything perfectly eye to eye, but we're naming the fact that unity ultimately comes from our adherence to the Word of God, right? In a, in a kind of uh, pure and applied sense, um, we're using the Scripture. It's our authority. It sits over us. Now, let me just name a couple of problems today that I see broadly in the church. Kind of two tendencies within the churches today that undermine the concept of unity based in truth. The first is a kind of what's called ecumenism. <clears throat> Terrible word. Ecumenism. Maybe you've heard of the ecumenical movement. Ecumenism. Um, this is the movement that says everyone who just claims or professes to follow Christ um, is part of one body. No matter how much they ignore sound doctrine or hold to uh, extravagant errors, as long as they name the name of Christ, they are part, truly a part, of the one body. Now, we know that that's not true, right? And even the Lord himself said in Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to inherit the kingdom of God. Often the way that this error crops up in the broader church is people will say, look, we live in a time where we need to get beyond doctrinal differences. Um, we just need to enjoy one another. We need to work together at every opportunity. Um, we don't need to worry about differences that arise from the study of God's Word. That's not important. That's one error. I think it's a problem. And it's kind of out there today, uh, broadly in the air that we breathe. We just need to get along to go along. But I think this is an error, and actually it pushes against what we've been studying about uh, unity. There's another harmful tendency, and um, the other tendency is to overlook sinful behaviors and kind of embrace everyone within the church's shadow, no matter how disobedient they are to God's word, right? Um, the point is um, that there are uh, many, many today in the church that said you should never confront people in sin. So they would read some of the letters of the New Testament, Jude. <laughs> they would read 1 John and say, wow, Jude and John were being really harsh. How intolerant of them, right? We need to, for the sake of unity, not exercise church discipline. We should not confront sin. Those things are divisive. We should not do that. That goes back to what I said about unity in the beginning, that unity cannot be man-made. There are a lot of ways that people, I think, in the churches today are trying to create unity that's man-centered. One is kind of a false ecumenism that says, doesn't matter if you say you're Jehovah's Witness or Mormon or Catholic or Christian, despite the wide variety of differences in teaching of all those groups, as long as you profess Christ, that one profession means that you're part of the one body. I don't think so. I don't think so. And the other is, that uh, we're going to have unity with just anyone and everyone, and we're never going to uh, 
practice biblical church discipline. We're not going to reprimand sin. We're not going to rebuke it. We're going to tolerate whatever, just so long as, again, you name the name of Christ, however paltry that confession is. These are very man-made ways of approaching unity, and they really are not the kind of unity that Paul's been talking about here in uh, Ephesians 4. Does that make sense? Difficult days for unity, <laughs> biblical unity uh, today, but important discussion, which is why it's our fifth pillar of Christian character, right? A biblical understanding of unity. Any thoughts before we close down this morning? Okay, all right, giving us some things to think about perhaps. All right, let's pray.